call. Okay. Yes. Set. Okay. Ready? Thanks. Good evening. This is the call of the Wilmette Public Library District Board of Trustee meeting to order on Tuesday, November 19th at 7.31 p.m. All notices have been posted, and we also have some observers as well as presenters in the audience tonight. Can we have the roll call, please? Trustee Barges here. Trustee Fishman? Here. Trustee Johnson? Uh, Trustee Riddle? Here. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Here. Trustee McDonald? Here. Thank you. Given that we have some uh, three members of the public here, are there any comments that you'd like to make? Okay, thank you. Behind number section number one, you got the minutes from the October 15th, 2019 meeting. And uh, we started something new. I guess as a result of the parliamentary procedure workshop that we attended, we decided uh, that from now on, if there are any changes to the minutes, that they should be submitted to Cynthia by noon. And if there are noon of Tuesday, the day prior to that, and pending uh, any changes, we, they need to be in writing, and we will hold the approval of the minutes to the next meeting. So saying that, are there any, is there a motion to adopt the minutes? A motion to adopt the minutes from last meeting on October 15th, 2019. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. Can we have a roll call? Yes. <laughs> Trustee Barsis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Aye. Trustee McDonald. Aye. And Trustee Johnson. That's out of line. Okay. We have a full schedule tonight, and we are going to start with, uh, and do you want to introduce? Okay. I'm um, joining us this evening from uh, uh, Ingberg Anderson Architects is Joe Huberty, from, um, who's going to be presenting about our capital reserve study proposal. Joe, if you please. Thank you, and good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Anthony has asked me to describe a, a bit of a process that we've used with a number of libraries over the past 10 years to help assess the physical condition of buildings. Uh, there's multiple purposes behind the study. One is just to determine its actual condition and understand what measures are necessary to extend the useful life of any facility as much as is practical. Uh, the second reason to undergo the study is to think about the financial resources that are necessary to maintain and repair portions of the building as they age out. Uh, I know a number of you have been associated with the building for extended periods of time, and you know the cost of construction, and you understand that over time there are significant systems that have rather noticeable costs associated with their repair or replacement. And the idea is to use the study to help gauge the amount of money that needs to be put aside so that you can handle those repairs or replacements as they occur. So not only does it give you a sense of when the expenditures are needed, it gives you a sense of the amount of money that will be necessary to conduct the, the repair. The process is really about assessing the, the building in terms of its uh, existing structure, uh, mechanical systems, general utility, uh, age of finishes, its appearance, safety. It's a pretty broad range of characteristics. And we try and assess all of the major systems that go into a building. That assessment is done uh, on a one-day walkthrough that follows a review of building drawings, any of the specifications that you have that relate to those drawings, any repairs, uh, major projects that you've undertaken in the past five years that would give the review team a sense of what they're going to be looking at the day we walk through the building. So we don't show up cold. Uh, the idea is to come in with a specific set of these are the things that have been challenging, uh, the, these are the ages of the systems, we've got some information on the equipment that's actually in the building. So we know what we're looking for when we come on site. And then the idea is to uh, take a good look at it based on our experience and try and gauge whether or not it's aging in conformance with its anticipated life expectancy. Many things actually do track reasonably close to what one would predict just knowing how it was made, when it was installed. Uh, there's other systems that 
given your nature as a public institution, uh, open to a lot of people, you see heavy traffic, there's some things that will age more quickly than, than one would predict if it were installed in something less public, uh, for example. Uh, most public entities uh, are aware of their obligations with respect to public treasure, and they actually engage in fairly robust maintenance programs. So we actually see a number of systems that have lifetimes that go beyond what would be expected based on uh, literature review. Uh, so it really is uh, an assessment of the actual condition of your equipment in your building and not just, you know, here's what the book says uh, about life expectancy and replacement costs. The hope is through that uh, walkthrough that we identify anything that is of major concern that can't be covered in a walkthrough. I think of this as an annual checkup, and if there's something disconcerting about your blood work or your, your heart rate, your blood pressure, we, we schedule more tests kind of thing. Examples are uh, we found um, electrical panels that were throwing off more heat than a boiler, so you know we, we tested voltage and uh, <laughs> things of that nature. Uh, sometimes you can look at masonry and see uh, things moving around, water coming through joints, little bits of corrosion being expressed on the outside of the building, and that, that tells you that water has gotten behind uh, the face of the wall, and that's a reason for concern. We'll do a little bit of exploratory work as part of a, a supplemental project. But this first thing is really to gauge how well the building is doing in general and if there are any particular areas of concern. Um, that inspection is paired with any of the knowledge that you or your maintenance team can provide to give us a, a snapshot of the conditions of the building at this point in time. We take all of that information and go and put it into what we call a tracking file. That really is the basis of the report. Uh, Anthony, I think, has provided a series of uh, handouts from us, but at the root of it is a, a list of just about everything we can think of as having any significant value in your building. Um, Depending on the level of detail that you're looking for, uh, we'll get into uh, pieces of furniture, uh, but individual window shades, individual windows, um, exposures, different phases of construction of the building. Uh, it goes on, in some instances, 17, 18 pages worth of detail. Uh, and we assess each of those items uh, based on expected lifespan, uh, observed life, remaining lifespan, and then probable cost to repair. Based on those projections, we calculate out a replacement cost uh, in the year of obsolescence. And then that becomes a basis for uh, assessing a number of items. And I think the key to this process isn't so much that you get a report at the end, but you get an interactive worksheet that allows you in many ways to navigate through a series of probable questions. And the first element in that is what we call our dashboard. And it really lets you uh, select a, a particular year or a particular building system or part of the building. Let's say you're interested in the roof or you're interested in the exterior masonry. Uh, you want to talk about carpet. Uh, there's little quick buttons that allow you to just go and look at those kinds of elements in the building. Uh, you can pick a year and say, you know, we're doing budgeting. I want to look out for the next five years. What should I anticipate in terms of maintenance costs on the building? We can aggregate uh, in five-year windows or we can predict, uh, select particular years. So it's really helpful for analysis of likely uh, expenses uh, as you do financial planning. The tool is flexible enough so that we can aggregate these things into logical uh, composite projects. It's a little bit more cost effective to group things together and do bigger projects all at once rather than to remobilize for a series of projects over time. So as you're thinking about your strategic expenditures, if you know there's improvements that you want to make to the building and you want to avoid the oh, if we just hadn't done that work last year, uh, it does, does a better job of helping you knit together repair as well as service improvement types of projects over the course of the project. So uh, that dashboard really gives you a lot of opportunities to filter the data into useful uh, components. The other thing that the approach does is allows you to update the, the basic tracking file. So as you make repairs, whether it's a rooftop replacement, drinking fountain replacement, table, chair, whatever it happens to be, by entering the new date into this, you have a constantly updated tool that always keeps you current. So this isn't something that ages out over a year or two. It's something that if you maintain it, it really gives you the ability to stay current uh, and maintain that, uh, that focus as the calendar rolls from year to year. The other thing that that's, that's nice about the interactive nature of that is as you do repairs, we can put in more specific will-met 
related cost data for each of those repairs. I'm getting a lot of data from material suppliers and contractors based on our assessment of what things ought to cost. Uh, so in some ways, it's a little theoretical. But when you do a carpet replacement in a room like this, you'll have an invoice for that, and then we can update the data for that line, and it becomes much more specific, much more accurate to, to your building. We do try to anticipate um, overall project costs. So when we talk about something like uh, we need new carpet in this room, as an example, we'll ascertain the cost to remove existing carpet. We'll do a little prep work on the flooring so that you know it's level. There'll be no adhesive left or gouges in the floor. You get the new carpet. There'll be a base uh, installed around so it's nice and clean. Uh, there's money allocated for general contractors, overhead and profit. So we try and make sure that it's as holistic of a cost as we can, not that you're surprised by, well, this is two-thirds more than I thought it would be, and it's because we left out labor or we left out demolition, those sorts of things. We do make certain assumptions about the scale of your project. Uh, very few people would literally recarpet one room at a time. We'll gauge our pricing on something like <coughs> we're going to re recarpet this wing of the building and try and get some economy of scale built in here. We don't want to put our thumb on any of these numbers to the extent that we're skewing the, the result and making it look more expensive than it, it likely will be. Uh, and the last component that's get, that gets built in is escalation. We assume a certain amount of escalation per year. And so when we're projecting a probable cost out 15 years, we're trying to build in a compound escalation at a rate that makes some sense. Uh, our escalation rate tends to be lower than the actual rate of escalation within the construction industry to avoid well, you know, 15 years of compounding kind of, again, leading us astray. So as you're nearing a likely replacement date, it's helpful to go back and reassess you know, two or three years in advance of a probable project. You know, how, how close have we been to approximating that 10, 15 years worth of, of escalation? Uh, the last bit is to circulate uh, this document uh, uh, to the library and to a number of construction industry professionals that we respect. There's a couple of construction management firms that we work with pretty regularly. We want to have everyone poke as many holes at it as we can before it becomes uh, your tool. Um, and through that auditing process, we'll do some refinement to this document. Uh, and then we write the report. And that's a, a snapshot for people that just loathe spreadsheets. Uh, every once in a while, it's nice to have a verbal summary uh, by building system, by level, by uh, portion of the building, uh, just to give you sort of a kind of a, a sanity check on uh, a myriad of data. Uh, and that, that can be useful for a number of people. But the essential element that uh, most people have found to be of use is the Excel uh, document. If you're contemplating any sort of renovations, improvements, expansions, you know, whatever your strategic vision for the facility is over time, we can set up parallel analyses that assume we're not doing any of that. Uh, it's most likely that we're doing these things. Uh, we might be doing it in a couple of phases. So if there's any sense of any sort of uh, variables that you want us to assess, uh, let us know at the beginning. It's fairly easy to include that as a baseline project. It's certainly possible to insert it later. But if there's anything that you're contemplating, we want this document to be as flexible as it can be out of the gate. And if for some reason uh, the vision of the board shifts and uh, the tool becomes a little out of alignment, I am more than happy to go through and update uh, those components to help bring it back into alignment. The underlying hope, of course, is that there's someone on the library's team uh, that is keeping it current on a as it occurs kind of basis. But periodic checkups, uh, I have no uh, problems helping sort through, you know, why isn't the file doing what I thought it should do? How do I add a filter, any of those kinds of components? So we really want it to be a tool for you that you use on a consistent basis. So that sounds pretty long-winded for a, a couple page proposal. No. But. Yes. Well, that was a little note that I made. Um, right, who maintains that spreadsheet? Yeah, it that'll come down to your preference. There are some libraries that treat it like a static report and it goes on a server and they never get it out. I think the libraries that are happiest with it actually use it on a pretty regular basis. And someone takes the effort to get to know how to manipulate uh, the file uh, and they're the happiest with it. There's a group that uh, periodically, you know, once a year, they'll call and say, we've done these things. Can you put it into the workbook for us? 
Uh, so it isn't a constant update, but it's a fairly regular update. Uh, and there's a number of libraries that every three, four, five years, uh, they have us repeat the process, and mm. that's how it gets updated. So in many ways, it's up to you how, how current do you want it kept, do you have the capabilities or desire to do it in-house, and, and without sort of bringing the whole engineering team out again, I, I can enter a lot of data at no cost to you. It's kind of that was maintaining a relationship right. kind of thing, right? Uh, the real time is bringing the engineering team out to the site to assess. Director Austin, you had experience with it. Who managed it at your institution? You so in full disclosure, I did using Greg Anderson and, uh, and Joe's consulting at Palatine Public Library District when I was director there. Um, and our staff maintained that workbook. Um, when we made updates, um, it was our goal to um, incorporate that, um, those changes into that workbook so that we did have that longitudinal information. Because it seems like if it, if it organically is changing over time, as you pointed out, that seems to be the most effective use of the tool. And so between right. your guidance and your experience with it so far, that would seamlessly kind of fall into place here with someone keeping it up to date. Right. Right. Okay. Is there training for whomever? Keeps that maintains that right. Uh, I use a couple of standard uh, filters and equations in Excel, uh, so I can explain oh, okay. uh, all of that. Uh, other than that, it's just an array of data. Um, the biggest element in this that takes some skill is the the visual assessment. The engineering team knowing what they're looking at. I'll be looking at roofs, exterior wall, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. uh, we rely on the reports from your ongoing building maintenance people, anyone that services uh, HVAC systems and the like, will look at your elevator reports, uh, fire uh, protection system certifications. So there's a skill level there. Uh, and then uh, we rely on a number of sources for what is baseline current pricing for various components. Um, the biggest trick there is recognizing that anything that we're replacing we have to remove the existing piece, and that can be fairly complicated, cumbersome, expensive. And then big pieces of equipment that we're bringing in often can't be craned in magically. They have to be brought in in pieces and, and assembled. So depending on the part that we're looking at, assessing the, the impact of the fact that you're an existing facility on cost to install is the only tricky part. The Excel workbook itself is, is pretty straightforward. Yes. Could you give us an understanding of the the one day run through, and then as a po and then in addition to the, those supplemental visits with your team, and yeah. how large your team is, more or less, on that one day versus kind of the right. other visits? So uh, there's there's two architects. I actually have a fellow I do a lot of work with who put himself through school roofing buildings, so I rely on, on that expertise. Uh, we'll go through it and do uh, the corn shell. Uh, there's usually a, a mechanical uh, HVAC, heating, ventilating, air conditioning uh, engineer. There's usually a plumbing engineer. Uh, that person may or may not be the same as fire protection. Uh, there's a separate civil engineer that will be coming through looking at your, your grounds, uh, looking at, uh, you've got a couple of different paving systems. We want to look at the condition of that, uh, assess uh, general flow of water as well as kind of appearance of the, the surfaces themselves. Uh, and then a, an electrical engineer. That will be coming through, uh, primarily looking at power, uh, lighting, the low voltage uh, systems, alarm systems, and that sort uh, will be part of the electrical package. Uh, we typically don't end up doing um, telecommunications, your, your core data, phone, kind of network, usually have a, a, a technology plan that's focused on uh, a routine periodic replacement of those systems. Uh, if you want that, that can be part of it, but uh, typically that's not part of the, the process. So the whole team will get their specific drawings in advance of the visit. Uh, one of the things we'll do in advance is ask for all the drawings that you have. Uh, I'll probably be calling. I've been through your building several times, and I know it's been put together over generations. <laughs> uh, and we'll want to understand where things start and stop. I know you've been working at uh, upgrades and improvements, so we'll want to know, understand the extent of all that. So we'll try and get a, a baseline spreadsheet put together so that we know the, the vintage of what we're looking at. <coughs> um, we'll be looking through all of the manuals and repair books so that we've got as much information on specific pieces of equipment as we can before we actually come to the site. When we do come to the site, uh, we usually start out with a, a day, in a, uh, a couple hours in a room uh, like this, listening to the, the stories of the people that maintain the facility on a day-to-day -day basis. 
uh, if there's anything in particular that you've relayed about a particular system and it suggests to us that we should be calling your uh, mechanical repair service and getting the lowdown, we'll have done that kind of research in advance. Uh, and then it's uh, literally walking through the building, looking at all of the mechanical rooms for the engineering team, uh, service entry points, uh, sticking our head above ceilings in key areas. Uh, the engineers get a little dirtier than the architects do. Uh, poor Sean has to go on the roof, so he gets a little, a little dirtier. Uh, our primary challenges that day are would be snow. So if we can't see uh, roof edges, uh, the base of the building, those can be challenges. We'll come back when the weather breaks and fill in missing pieces of that. Uh, so that usually takes, uh, um, usually until mid-afternoon. Uh, we'll reconvene as each of the disciplines is wrapping up to see if they have any questions that they want to pose to the Billings uh, Facilities Maintenance Team uh, before we head out. Uh, once we've done all that, everybody will work on uh, their draft of the document. Uh, we'll, we'll send that out for review while we're getting pricing data for those pieces just to see if there's anything we missed. And then once we have the pricing data, it goes out again uh, for review. Uh, once that review is satisfactory, you get a draft report, uh, and then we tweak that once you've seen that. Uh, so it's one intensive day by a lot of people on site, and then periodic reviews of process pieces until we come up with these two final documents. Mm -hmm. So a lot of you will schedule that after right. having and obtaining the owner-supplied information that, right. we've, that we've given you. Right. And any... Any pre-interviews before that? Any phone call interviews? Or, or it all it all should occur when you're on site. Right. Uh, if you give the word, uh, the next call is to Anthony. Uh, I'd like to come in and grab the drawings. Let's talk again. I've actually got a few notes from when we, we conversed earlier in the year, kind of the general scale. Um, but we will try and flesh that out. And then if there really is that sort of, these are problematic areas, if there's an outside resource that you've been using, call our roof inspector kind of thing. Mm -hmm. They'll give you the, the inside scoop. We would do that in advance of coming on site. Mm -hmm. We want to be as prepped as we can uh, to understand what we're going to be looking at. Yeah, one day. That, oh, that's what I was just yeah. trying to understand for that one yeah. day. Yeah, it's usually enough. Uh, the The biggest, uh, uh, it's probably public. Uh, we found a lot uh, goofy at Highland Park. They have a very old uh, original building and mm -hmm. you know people yeah. try to make it work. Mm -hmm. uh, for uh, many, many years, and there were just uh, incrementally over time, those systems couldn't handle everything that was being asked of them. Uh, so that's where we found the glowing uh, electrical panel. That's where we found kind of stone kind of falling off the building. Um, they live in a forest, so there, there were lots of leaves built yeah, up on the roof sure, that was sure. kind of. So that was one instance where the walkthrough just said, there's got to be some more investigative work, and we, we worked through a series of what investigations were appropriate uh, that were more detailed. The other approach is to take the, uh, the assumption that there's going to be a lot more wrong than anybody wants, and we're going to go all in, and uh, we're going to have a separate roof inspector. Uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, specific electrical tests done. Uh, we're going to have in invasive masonry testing just as an assumption right out of the gate. And if you didn't need it, well, too bad, you got it. Uh, so this is more of a pre-screening, uh, and it's it's a it's an office visit, kind of annual checkup, kind of format. Uh, you know, knock on wood, we haven't missed anything major in that walkthrough. Um, you, you bring a bit of pessimism to these sure. kind of walkthroughs, so you're you're looking for things that aren't working well or could be a big issue if they stop working. Um, Water is essential to life, but it's the enemy of a building, so we're pretty skeptical about any kind of joint between materials. So we're looking pretty seriously at that. Mechanical systems are the most complex thing in your building. Uh, they're the most expensive thing to purchase, to maintain, most difficult thing to integrate into a control system. Uh, so we're looking pretty rigorously at that. You're totally dependent on electrical systems to operate, uh, so we want to understand uh, the integrity of, of that kind of system. Uh, it tends not to go out of whack as quickly as mechanics do, so uh, the impacts there aren't aren't usually as noticeable. Uh, but yeah, the the one day walkthrough, as I mentioned, is yeah over ten years. It's it's really proven to be pretty effective. I had one question about the tool. After, 
if anybody else. Do you send any updates, say three years out, and you see cost changing based on your assumptions? How do you we do. communicate that with the client? Yeah. Um, over 10 years, you can imagine that the tool has mm -hmm. been tweaked. Uh, we did start out with, uh, you know, uh, escalation. Um, it doesn't match the general economy. Uh, escalation in the construction industry tends to outpace uh, the general rate of inflation. Um, that, that started getting things out of line too quickly. Um, there was a pretty uh, hard uh, recession that hit the construction industry and that impacted prices. So we, we did send out notes okay. uh, when, we're, when we know people are contemplating projects and we know uh, steel is subject to tariffs, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We're seeing uh, impacts on cost of drywall. We do send out little notices. Um, there is a general note, and everyone kind of forgets it in the document. As you're approaching a project, get an update. Um, it's time to move into more detail that I can provide in that one day kind of walkthrough. Um, you want to start getting into real engineering and real cost estimating. So those notices are sent out. We've been down this path numerous times. Most recently, we did uh, over $5 million in renovation of HVAC, plumbing, okay. electrical, et cetera. Okay. Um, when was that finished? About three years ago, mm -hmm. three and a half, whatever. The, but so the systems um, should be well documented and in mm -hmm. pretty good shape given the fact that we're not looking, I mean, part of what we replaced, for example, was a 50-year-old boiler. Oh, excellent. Uh, we, re we also integrated um, HVAC and ventilation systems into one control structure. Hello. Yeah. Uh, so th the big things that needed attention, we've tended to. Right. Um, what I see is unique about what you're delivering is that in past assessments of our condition, we got a report, a static report. I have not seen anyone deliver the working tool that your spreadsheet represents mm -hmm. in managing to keep this a living document. Um, and so that's really the part that I see as the value added here. We have, in our past reports, the static reports. We have not had a working tool to keep that current right. from any of our past vendors. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how you developed that tool so that it was able to be maintained as you've described? Right. Uh uh, the very first one was a call out of the blue. Uh, someone's been asking why we're squirreling away money. <laughs> uh, we, we think we know why. Uh, it's to protect us from uh, significant expenditures, but I need a document that tells me how much I should be keeping, uh, and I need that pronto. Uh, so I grabbed a group of people familiar with libraries, and we walked through the building. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we had the op option at that point of just making a list uh, or putting it into an Excel document. And it quickly became obvious that there were a few parameters that would be changing over time. Uh, and it just struck uh, the mechanical engineer and myself that uh, if we were doing this for a building that we owned, we would want to be able to keep it updated. So that's really what sold us on, mm -hmm. on Excel. Uh, the things that have been added over time are to uh, illustrate kind of the method by which we were arriving at a particular number. It's, it's usually hard to sort of look at uh, an item and then a single figure and know, is that right? So we break it down into, this is what the hardware costs, this is what the labor to install it costs, here's an allowance for all that other goofing around, uh, here's overhead and profit, uh, here's our presumed escalation rate, here's what it will cost today. There's a little field that lets you type in any year, uh, any year literally, uh, and it'll tell you the cost of that repair in that year and then the cost for kind of the target year. And it just sort of started to address incrementally over time the questions that people were feeding us when we got these, uh, they got these reports in their hands. Mm -hmm. So I would say the, the number of uh, fields, I'm into like column A, H now with all the data fields. I probably had half of that, you know, in the initial cost model. 
So it was really built to respond to questions that owners had based on questions they were getting. What if I did it this year? You know, how do I lump these together? Why does it cost that much? I can go to Lowe's and get it for you know, a fraction of that cost. Why are you telling me it costs so much a square foot for carpet? Kinds of things. So that kind of data has been useful. Thank you. It looks like you've, I, I thought it was helpful to look at the different square or the different um, areas. So it looks like you've had a lot of experience all across the board. Right. Right. Uh, a lot of this because it is trying to help you manage uh, public money. It's a process that really applies to uh, a library of any, any size. Um, the sort of effort that goes into it really relates to uh, not so much size of building, but the complexity of the building. Uh, if you have three different mechanical systems and you're only 50,000 square feet, that's more work than 100,000 square feet with one mechanical system. So it really is a complexity-based uh, effort. Uh, but in no case does it ever take uh, someone more than a day to walk through if, if they've done their homework right in advance of that visit. Right? We had five <laughs> systems prior to the last project. <laughs> that sounds like a record in my, <laughs> my experience. That's, that's a few, quite a few. <laughs> Good questions. Yeah. I was wondering what if you're able to share any of the challenges you faced with any of the libraries that you've had with this with more of the interactive tool. Uh, if you're able to, you know, share those with us and 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 the costs maybe that were associated with like any follow up maybe. Yeah. Is it just like an hourly like consulting? Cost? So some of it depends on where people uh, pick up uh, this process. Uh, the fact that you've been through a recent significant project suggests that you might not have as much trouble as other libraries. Uh, I think a lot of boards are faced with the essential conundrum of, do I keep my uh, levy low? And then when we have major repairs, we go to the public and ask for money to re-roof the building, uh, well, re replace the mechanical system. You have a sense of the cost, scale of cost associated with that. And a lot of libraries will wait to the last minute to ask for that and find themselves in a bit of a bind. So the, the real challenge is convincing someone that this has to be done uh, and it has to be funded now versus the uh, we're going to put a little bit of money away each year, but we're really we're not hoarding it without just uh, cause. And so the rationale for putting money away incrementally over time is a challenge that libraries face. You have to be able to justify it. And the uh, last minute uh, justification for why we weren't putting money away incrementally over time mm -hmm. can be a problem. The uh, actual uh, putting together of the documents, uh, the complexity of the building is, is a, uh, the biggest hurdle. Uh, but you know, when you come right down to it, it's all, it's either brick or steel or glass. Sure. Um, it's more about vintage. Uh, mechanical systems will be the most complex. Um, our, our engineer is a nationally recognized library and public building uh, engineer. Uh, so I would say half, half is going to be an exaggeration. A significant number of libraries in the metropolitan area have been designed by our consulting engineer. So they, they do know what they're looking at. Um, but I mean, so also with the interactive tool and those um, examples you shared, did oh. they have to, you know? There's two tricks. Uh, the, the temptation to insert another line uh, is perfectly permissible, but you have to have all of the columns extended. For legibility, I've usually compressed and hidden a number of columns. If you're copying and pasting in that hidden mode, things go cattywampus sure. pretty quick. So the big trick is anytime you're going to play in it, you copy it, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. archive one, yeah. and then start playing around. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, we tend to, uh, if you're going to be one of those hands-on kind of uh, users sure. of the document, mm -hmm. uh, send us a copy periodically. So I always have the same version that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So that when you call me and say, hey, what about line 168? We've got the same line 168. And what, is that an extra cost? With no. You? That's part of our right. relationship after, right. this, after this. Great. After Anthony stopped managing the Palatine uh, model, I got a new fellow. And <laughs> that was a bit of a, a, a learning curve. <laughs> right. He was very diligent, and everything went in there uh, 
but he wasn't part of the process that built the mm -hmm. workbook for their library. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there were a lot of calls about how'd you come up with this, why this, how do I do this? Um, but that's all included in the, in the price. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next presentation on our agenda is from our auditor, Dan Berg from SickEdge. Thank you. Um, in the past, what I've done is basically walk through the annual financial report, and I was curious if that's what you'd like me to do again tonight, or something different. I don't sing your dance. It might be helpful since we got it kind of late. Okay. Okay. So. Um, just to give you a little background, we began the audit in July with a day of preliminary field work where we come out and interview staff and talk about what's changed uh, from the prior year in internal controls, in contracts, in personnel, um, and to make sure we have an understanding of the internal controls, make sure we understand what changed or what is potentially going to change in our audit and make sure that we know what's important by asking if there's any fraud risks, much like the questionnaires you all get, um, to see if there's any particular direction we should be auditing toward, uh, or if there's any risk perceived by uh, staff or elected officials so that we have an understanding of where we should concentrate our efforts. We really didn't ha get any feedback that directed our attention into a new area, so we we more or less did uh, uh, an audit uh, based on uh, known risk assessments. We came back in early October for a couple of days and the audit went very smoothly. Uh, we were able to get a list of items requested of staff out on our, uh, our portal and that was well populated ahead of time. And of course, as auditors, we are required to surprise staff with some additional requests of invoices and materials so all of that went very well and resulted in getting you this report uh, in November in November um, and us able to be here uh, uh, now the we'll walk through just a few things here uh, the first is on page one two and three on page two of the annual financial report not the uh, auditors communication to the board, the annual financial report, the thicker of the two documents. Um, these are the only three pages that are truly ours. All the rest of the report is drawn from information given to us by staff or written by staff. And we'll get to that by, in a moment. But on the top of page two is our opinion. It's commonly referred to as a clean opinion. We call it an unmodified opinion. It's the best opinion we're allowed to give. It simply says that the financial statements present fairly in all material respects the financial position and operation. Uh, it is on the cash basis and modified cash basis, and that's what we emphasize on the basis of accounting paragraph. Immediately following that, on pages M, D, and A, one through four, is the management discussion and analysis. And the reason we number it MDNA 1 through 4 is so that this is the last item we get to finalize the report. We don't want to have to repage the whole thing. We never know if this will be three pages, five pages, or four pages. So we came up with that numbering system. This is written by staff. It compares last year to the, this year and tells the reader why things have changed. Very strongly recommend if you haven't gone over this report yet, you start there. Um, with that, we get to the financial statements starting on page four. The statement of net position includes uh, capital assets that, uh, and includes accumulated depreciation on those capital assets. The library has no debt related to that capital at those capital assets. If it did, that would be in the liabilities. But being on modified cash, we only include um, 
the capital assets. Below that in the net position is uh, basically the equity of the library. In the order, you cannot spend it. So the least available for spending is at top. The, the invested in capital assets, meaning the building, its contents, things that you cannot be in business without. Cannot spend that $8.3 million. Below that is restricted for. You can spend it, but only on what it's restricted for. So basically, you've levied taxes for specific purposes, audit, et cetera, and you can only spend it on that. Except for the capital improvements, the special reserve fund at the bottom, that's for capital improvements, okay? That's your special reserve fund. And then lastly, the unrestricted is what is available for any lawful corporate purpose to be spent, okay? Uh, on the following page, page five, is the statement of activities. It's the only financial statement in the history of accounting that's in the shape of a seven, but there's a reason for that. That's to ex uh, show you what your expenses are, including depreciation, and then going across what the uh, uh, program revenues or grants are to fund those and the, the bracketed number at the end is to tell the reader what needs to be subsidized by involuntary resource providers, taxpayers. So basically that negative six million dollars has to come from the general public and, and property taxes for the most part, replacement taxes, interest income, uh, investment income, etc. So we see there that the change in that position is a positive fifty-six million or fifty-six thousand dollars. So, if the public were or your constituents were to ask you if you're better off economically this year than last year, that's your answer. Okay, on a modified cash basis. Okay, the following page is your cash basis uh, balance sheet. It emphasizes your two major funds and de-emphasizes the non-major funds. Uh, so your general fund has a total fund balance available for spending of 8.6 million, but the total fund balance is 8.8 .8 million. Special reserves now at uh, 6.15 million dollars. And then the smaller funds have the equity as, as listed there. Uh, audit, liability, insurance, retirement, et cetera. Okay. Over on page eight is your Statement of revenues, collected, expenditures paid, and changes in fund balance on the cash basis. And if we focus on the third line from the bottom, you see the general fund reduced fund balances by $332,000 as a result mostly of the transfer out to special reserve of $300,000. Before that transfer, it had slightly overexpended its, its expenditures by only $32,000, special reserve fund had a net of 68,000, 69,000 before the transfer and 369,000 after. There's only a couple other pages I, I generally want to talk about. And being that we live in Illinois, page 39, the very last page of the report is your IMRF page. Seems to be a hot topic among elected officials, less so in IMRF only entities like the libraries and park districts that I work with. But we see the third row from the bottom, page, so 39, the very last page of the report. And this will eventually grow to 10 years, but we implemented the standard four years ago, or five, yeah, four years ago, so it has five years. And the third row from the bottom where there's numbers and percentages is your percentage funding. Remember that this is as of 1231 annually, so we take a snapshot of the market value of the investments in the IMRF portfolio attributable to Wilmette Public Library District. And that's why the number has been 91, down to 88, up to 89, 99 at 2017 and then down to 85 in 2018. December 31 was not a great year to measure investment portfolios in 2018, but a superlative year in 2017. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be on this roller coaster ride 
uh, of funding levels for ever. Okay. Um, so we always think that if you're above 60% as auditors, you're doing well in, IM, in, in police, fire, those situations, in IMRF north of 80, and obviously you spiked to nearly 100% funded last year, so yeah. not much to worry about there at all here. IMRF is the retirement fund in Illinois that works. Um, preceding this page is a 10-year trend schedule of your uh, property tax, assessed valuation, rates, levies, and collections. Um, a lot of my elected officials think this is an interesting page, so I just wanted to point that out to you. Um, that's all I have to say about this report. Um, obviously, uh, the district has been ma managing its funds in a, in, a, in, a, in a good manner to be as comfortably funded as you have been and have the reserves to spend on capital projects. But I think it's a good idea to know how much you need in the future before you just you need to know. I think strategic planning is key in all of our organizations, so I commend you for looking at that. Um, the other document, any questions on this document or on the audit process? Uh, any um, thoughts you can give us on credit risk management and risk management just in general, what you're seeing? here as opposed to, I know it's one area. It's, it's um, an interesting Investments. area for libraries because you're incapable of investing in the stock market, in mutual funds, and anything exotic. Uh, it's designed, the state laws are designed to protect the principal and it therefore restricts your ability to make money in the, in the investment market. So the key is to make sure you understand your cash flow needs and ladder out your investments accordingly. I had, for a number of years, interest rates were so low, it didn't really matter much where you put your money. It was Illinois funds, or CDs, or, um, yes. or fixed income, you know, in the uh, U.S. Treasuries and agencies, you weren't making any money anyway. So <laughs> you kind of kept it in cash, more or less. Now those rates are north of 2%. And we actually have to audit it investment income again because it's material. We hadn't had to do that for quite some time. But um, so people are looking harder and harder at shorter term CDs or long term and getting back into U.S. agencies. And um, a number of my clients with substantial portfolios have professional money managers as well for assistance in that. Um, I. I noticed that the concentration in investments and in general, the concentration of credit risk was considered um, in in this district. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if you're able to uh, give us your thoughts on. Well, the concentration you know. of credit risk is always a concern to make sure that you don't have too much money in any one vehicle. But the way the library is doing it is spreading its, its certificates of deposits out to a, a number of, of banks in order to have FDIC insurance over it at all Absolutely. times. So that's about as safe as you can get. Great. So that's very conservative, but right now that's, you're at least making above, again, north of 2% on your investments. I appreciate investments. that, yeah. mm -hmm. thank you. We also have the uh, auditor's communication to the Board of Trustees. This is the document where we would inform you if we had any problems mm -hmm. during the course of the audit. If we had serious problems, you would have known it long before tonight. Um, but in the first pages, pages two through five, is our required communication to the Board where we would tell you if we had disagreements with management or anything of, those, of that nature. No's are good in this part. No issues. Uh, we also are required to show you our adjusting journal entries. There were only two, which is outstanding. Good for, uh, good for us and good for you. Uh, and then we would show you the in the management letter any um, suggestions for improvements in operations or internal controls. 
these haven't really changed in prior since in since I've been doing the audit. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, decent segregation of duties, but we always want to put small organizations on alert that you should be on the lookout to to continue <clears throat> looking for improvements in that area. You're on the modified cash basis of accounting, which is fine. Mm -hmm. Many, many, many school districts, libraries, park districts, entities uh, in Illinois, governmental entities are perfectly legal. It's fine. Um, and then the market value of investments just needs to be monitored and reported and, uh, and changed at year end annually. Excuse me. <coughs> as part of the audit process. And then we have the next next set of uh, government accounting standards for pronouncements that may or may not affect you. There's a couple that may. Do you see any of them affecting us? The, the one that may are leases. Um, uh, most of my libraries lease the um, uh, uh, copiers, but in relation to your building, etc., it may not be material. Um, it's not meant to dissuade people from leasing. It just changes how we're going to account for it in the future. There won't be any operating leases. It'll all be capital leases, so you would have a fixed asset for the life of the lease. Some of my libraries additionally lease sections of their buildings to coffee shop, book, bookstore for the friends or what have you. There's a dollar lease. Those are nominal. The dollar lease, we don't care about those. But if you were to lease a section uh, or, you know, some, some actually have cell towers on their land, they, um, very few. but. So that lease income is something that we need to pay attention to. Um, I don't think any of the others will um, at all, actually. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you for your time. Thank Thank you. You. And as yeah, always, you. if you have a question comes up, Please don't hesitate to contact me. Okay. And thank you for all your help. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great work. It's been, been great thanks. working with you. Good job, all. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Moving on okay. to. Thank you. The treasurer's, the treasurer's report. Trustee Bobby. Okay. October is not a big month for receipt of real estate taxes. The bills go out in August. Mm -hmm. Can you speak up just a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, we received 57000 and change in real estate taxes, 23000 in general fund interest, and 14000 in replacement taxes. As I said, we're not, you know, October is not a month in which we get large portions of those uh, monies because the majority of it is paid shortly after the real estate taxes are are due. So August and September, when the bills go out, or, or are due August 1st, August and September are the big months when those monies are received. Um, our expenditures similarly were not um, extraordinary in October. Uh, we're just below 33 percent. Um, which is the expected four-month rate of expenditures. Uh, there are some accounts which are paid, uh, are, are, are ahead of that figure because things like periodicals and renewals sometimes have an annual renewal that occurs uh, at a fixed time of the year, and so you spend that portion of the allocation early. Uh, others are spent late. It, uh, there's nothing extraordinary there going on right now for us. Um, obviously, the largest expenditure was for uh, employee insurance. Um, that's normal also. Um, but we're in a consortium, and you know those those costs have been well managed over the last however many years as we're in the in the group. Um, CCS, our computer system, uh, is uh, or our, our circulation system, 
uh, is, is a normal expenditure. Um, there's nothing extraordinary in those in in those costs. Um, I think you know, as I said, I think that things are pretty much where we would expect them to be uh, for this time of year. Um, the only action item that we have to take with respect to the treasurer's report is approval of bills and salaries for October. You have the detail of that in the. Um, uh, in the attachments, uh, I move that we approve the bills and salaries for October. I'll second that. Any discussion? Question. I don't know if you've already discussed this, but I just was curious about um, a September check um, written to Shales Mc McNaught Construction. It says a September check was which was voided and reissued. Oh. They lost. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was, what was I going to say? What was the background there? <laughs> wow. Okay. No. I mean, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say they lost it. It got lost. I should say it got lost. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. We mailed it out. Yeah. They didn't get it. Yeah. It was big enough that we put a stop on it. Absolutely. It, so Good that's to know. That's what that was. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. No. It's been moved and seconded to approve the bills and salaries for the month of October 2019. Can we have a vote? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Jones. Uh, uh, Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. Okay. Moving to action items. Uh, last month we introduced the levy, which is basically to fund the budget that was approved. And so we will turn it over to Trustee Watt. Okay, the, um, the levy in, uh, is that we approved in tentative form uh, last month uh, is the same total dollar amount as last year's levy. So it's a 0% increase. There is some shifting from special fund or from the general fund to special funds because some of the general funds, special funds, excuse me, needed uh, additional revenue in the coming year. So um, what, what was done was that the amount of the levy in the special funds increased and the amount of the levy in the general fund was decreased by the same amount. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, uh, it's a 0% increase, uh, and there should be no, um, no problem with that with respect to its impact on local residents. Of course, we do not control what any other governmental bodies are levying, so we cannot determine what the total levies are. For example, uh, the village's... Uh, uh, flood control projects and some other activity that's going on might impose changes in the total property tax bill. That's not anything we have authority over. It's not something that we can impact. Uh, however, what you do have in your materials is a summary of um, where we stand and what our share of the levy has been in the past year. Uh, we're 3.6 percent of the total levy. This is from 2018 tax rates uh, from a report that the county issues. Um, we're 3.6 percent in District 39 and 3.7 in District 37. The principal difference there is the difference in the tax rates of the two school districts. Our levy is the same in both, but the percentages shift um, slightly because of the difference in the totals. Um, our levy amount um, is subject to some uh, decisions that the county clerk makes in extending it. Um, again, we don't control those. Um, so there's really nothing more that we can do, but you will find in the materials that you have before you um, a couple of ordinances that are related to instructions to the county clerk 
about how to handle our levy. So, for example, one of them specifies that, that the special fund levy should be, should be fixed and any reduction would need to occur from in the general fund levy. So, you know, but those are details that we're mandated to have to produce every year as part of the process. Um, the, um, so I would recommend, based on the prior actions of the board, uh, that we approve the, um, the new levy in the same amount as last year's levy. I'll, I'll make a motion if, I, if you haven't already done so. I'll move uh, to adopt ordinance number 2019-20-195 to levy taxes for library purposes for the fiscal year 2019-20 for a total of $5.428 million and 251 251. If I said the number right. 5.428, 5, 5 251. I'll second. Mm -hmm. Any discussion? Okay. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the adoption of Ordinance 2019-20-195 and Ordinance Levying Taxes for the Library Purposes for the Fiscal Year 2019-20 for a total of $5,428,000. Thousand two four hundred twenty eight two hundred fifty one thousand. I see. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a vote, please. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, not here. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Aye. Okay. You have yes. motion carries. <laughs> We, say I'll get it back. we have a companion motion to do at the same time, which is for the instructions to the Cook County Clerk. Yes, so we need to do that. Okay. I move approval of the motion instructing the Cook County Clerk regarding the library district's levy. I'll second. second. Okay, I'll second. Who seconded? I did. Stuart. Stuart. Thank you. Trustee. Wolf. I seconded the motion. Any discussion? Mm -mm. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. The adoption of resolution number 2019-20-202, instructions to the Cook County Clerk regarding the Wilmette Public Library District's 2019 levy. Okay. <clears throat> Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Aye. And Trustee McDonald? Aye. Next order of business is the capital reserve study proposal that we heard earlier from mm -hmm. that we talked a little bit more in depth from Inberg Anderson Architects. And it's behind tab number six. Details the project understanding and also gives additional references, deliverables, as well as the hourly rate if we are to be additional services. Do you want to talk a little more about it? Or I think we've talked a lot about it. We've talked a lot, but we can certainly get in discussion after we've got a motion. I'll okay. move approval. I'll move approval of the um, capital uh, reserve study proposal from Engberg Anderson Architects for a contract total of not to exceed, should I say 22500 or should I keep it at 22000 22000 Okay. A second. Discussion? I think the most important element here is that we have done this before. We have sought the same support from engineering firms at least four times in the past. Each time we have received a summary report which was a snapshot of what they found in their one day walkthrough and any follow up activities prior to the walkthrough and after but it was a static document. Um, in all the work that I've done with lots of different boards over the la over decades, um, I have not seen a product previously that matches the spreadsheet and planning document that this proposal delivers. Um, and I think that that is, is unique to their uh, process and, their, and what they deliver. 
Um, it also represents a considerable amount of work to create that type of a document. The documentation and the formulas that underlie it are a major investment of their professional expertise and time, and I think it should be respected as such, as uh, intellectual property that would should be treated as protected. Um, and so it's not something that we would appropriately um, turn over to their competitors to try to reverse engineer it. I think it's a matter of, of um, uh, our respect for their proprietary efforts that we, that we not do so. And as I said, I have not seen any other project of this type that delivered that tool. Um, and I've been doing this a long time. So I think the, you know, I think this is a unique proposal that gives us a resource we haven't had in the past and that no one else has provided us in our past studies that were, that had the same specifications. Um, even the project that we did a few years ago was based on a fixed snapshot report, not a planning tool. And so, and it worked fine at that, under those conditions. We immediately went through uh, a $5 million renovation project that updated bathrooms to meet ADA requirements, updated um, roofs and HVAC systems. We replaced uh, boilers, we replaced um, uh, our main um, HVAC system elements. Um, those are all important elements that will be uh, built, will be reassessed in this study. But we we've been through a process within the past five years that actually tried to address those needs. This is looking further ahead. The planning tool is the unique element here, and. Um, no one else has offered that to us in the past, and I have not seen, I did do some research online, and in looking over the planning, similar planning tools that other municipalities, park districts, libraries have put online, I didn't find anything that matches this. I did find dozens of other libraries and school districts that have used them. But it's all a product of Anger, Anger, Anders, Engberg Anderson's work and the development of this matrix. So I think this is a, a real plus for us to add this to our planning resources, and I recommend that we proceed. I support it for three reasons. One, we as trustees are good financial stewards to our community, and I think it provides us a way to access what we, what our capital needs are. I think also, I appreciate our director's experience using it, and I think it provides a tool for him to, on a daily basis, or not daily, but quarterly, to better work with his facility staff in terms of addressing his, you know, some of the needs, and just to keep track and when things might go south because you're not an expert, and so I think this is a tool that will help. And then I looked at both, if you look at a lot of the recommendations, not recommendations, but the jobs, a lot of them have gone back multiple times yeah. for more services or to update it. So mm -hmm. that, to me, signifies some degree of satisfaction mm -hmm. with the job. Other comments? Mm -hmm. As I mentioned before, I like that they have worked over, as you say, a number of times, but also different sizes. So they've seen all over. They've seen it all. Mm -hmm. So I think their expertise is, is so valuable. Mm -hmm. Any others? It's I do. Okay. I, um, I, during the finance committee meeting, this was something we discussed thoroughly. And um, just to let the other trustees know, who weren't here and some members of the public, we, I had some concerns and I think my first concern was the scope. At first I didn't understand their um, 
um, their uh, the scope of their work and then the product that they would be delivering and then the cost was something I was concerned about I I can admit that I had some sticker shock value and and then also getting bids you know from other uh, other consulting services that we um, we didn't do in this instance because we knew this tool so well Anthony knew this tool so well so I gained a lot of comfort with what Ron Rogers said tonight and what Lisa McDonald said that uh, this is a very specialized tool that we can use not only this year um, but it can take us you know 10 20 years from now and that it's that we're able to I think reach out and check back with the long-standing firm 10 plus years they've been in business and and um, and that they've specialized with libraries I think that is a huge plus for us um, their team of engineers architects um, seems to be also very um, capable and um, and you know long-standing as well um, the main thing I think this tool does is, is addresses the strategic planning and the budget help I think we need for a big, um, you know, a, a big news item, which is our special reserve. It's been public for um, for Wilmette, and it's also been something that I know we we've been trying to address and be as transparent about over. Um, now now and going forward our president going forward so that is a really big thing that you know really I think just continues our transparency and our um, our our desire to be transparent with the public and with Wilmette um, public library users so um, I, I support the tool I support um, the services with the architectural firm so thank you Anthony for your efforts in, in, in finding them and, and finding this tool. Anybody else? It's been moved and seconded. Approval of the Capital Reserve Study Proposal from Ingberg Anderson Architects for a contract total of 22000 And we have a roll call. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Aye. Aye. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Aye. Okay. Motion carried. Motion carried. Motion carried. Mm -hmm. I'll get it by the end. Okay, do you want to talk about the cleaning contract? Okay. Um, um, Wilmette Library has been with Complete Cleaning Incorporated for several years. Um, they provide daily uh, custodial services to the library. They maintain the cleanliness of the building. And uh, we continue to be satisfied with um, the services of Complete Cleaning. Um, they have presented a proposal this evening that is um, a 3% increase over last year's uh, proposal. Um, we have an annual agreement with them, and they have only raised their rates with us on two occasions previously. They have a pattern of tending to hold their contracts to um, three-year uh, pricing freezes. So um, we're kind of right at that time frame again with them. And um, as I said before, we're really satisfied with their services. Um, as I introduced um, hey, you to their services, I'm going to pause for just a moment. Library will be closed <laughs> in 15 minutes. Please bring your materials to the circulation desk now for checkout. Thank you. All right. Um, as I was saying in my, my messages to you earlier, I'm introducing this contract. Um, this organization um, is it is familiar to me as well as I, I use their services at Palatine Library and I went out to bid uh, for cleaning proposals there um, several years ago and ended up retaining com uh, complete um, and really found that their services were valuable. For me, what, what really stands above and beyond in addition to the quality of the service that they provide um, and the consistency um, and the really good communication, I feel, um, is that the president of the company actually comes through and walks the building um, on 
a regular basis and on an, on an irregular basis, so you don't know what day he's going to come in and when he's going to do his assessment. Um, but that's his snapshot, so he can see what um, how his crew is performing, um, how they did the night before, and so on. Um, so, and he can take notes and then follow up with them if there's anything that, that he'd like to see. Um, I find that an unusual uh, service that's provided by a cleaning crew or, or a cleaning crew executive. And um, for that, I feel confident in bringing this forward for you to um, reapprove this evening. Mm -hmm. I, I would <clears throat> totally agree with that, and particularly that he comes and, and takes that, an actual look. I don't think there are very many cleaning companies, <laughs> if any at all, that have that written in their uh, what they do with their proposal. And as far as what I've seen since we've had this company, um, the library has been clean. It's been kept up. What I expect to be done has been done. Um, it's a building that people feel good about when they come in, and that's partly because of the physical attributes that we have gotten with their, their service. So I highly recommend them also. Okay. I'll move approval of um, the complete cleaning company service agreement of February 1st, 2020 through February 1st, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, that's for a 4629 per month for 12 months for a contract total I need my glasses for this, of uh, $55,548. I second. Do we need to include any allocation for the additional services that are Most designated in the contract? Um, so Complete Cleaning offers a number of other services that are outside of the scope of their contract. Mm -hmm. What we're approving this evening is simply the, um, the daily maintenance of the facility. Mm -hmm. If at some later date we elected to um, engage with them to do spot cleaning of carpeting or so on, mm -hmm. um, we would do that separately. Okay. Any other discussion? It's been moved and second. That approval of complete cleaning company Inc. service agreement for February 1st, 2020 to February 1st, 2021 at $4,629 per month for 12 months for a contract total of 55548 And we have a roll call, please. Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Aye. And Trustee McDonald? Aye. On to the next one. Okay, the next item on the agenda is um, a renewal for our copier fleet. Um, Image Systems and Business Solutions, ISBS, has been our copier um, company for um, the past several years, actually going, going back um, to the Dick Thompson era. Um, so over 20 years um, they've been our copier vendor. And um, the last contract that we had with them was a five-year agreement. Um, this time around we've negotiated um, significant cost savings and have reduced our, our, um, our lease down to four, uh, four years. Um, I provided some additional information to you um, behind tab eight. Um, if you'd like to uh, make a motion, we can continue our discussion from there. Is there a motion? Okay, I'll make the motion. Um, I motion. Oh, sure, there you go. There you go. Thank you. I motion that we approve the Image Systems and Business Solutions Copier Fleet Upgrade and Renewal Agreement for December 1st, 2019 through 2001st, 2023 at $2,148 per month, and that's a 48-month contract for a total of $103,104. I'll second. Any discussion or questions? Okay. okay. It's been moved and seconded that uh, that Wilmette Public Library uh, utilize image systems and business solutions copy of fleet upgrade and renewal agreement for December 1st, 2019 through December 1st, 2023 at $2,148 per month for 48 months for a contract total of $103,104. Roll call. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Trustee Barshitz, yes. Trustee Fishman, absent. Trustee no, no, no. I'm here, I'm here. 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 I'm
You turn into a pumpkin? Yeah. <laughs> at, at night? Yeah. Getting close. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, the uh, the last contract that we have up for renewal this evening is our annual um, uh, property and casualty and workers' compensation insurance. Um, the library is a member of the Libraries of Illinois Risk Agency, LIRA, insurance pool. Um, this is a consortium that does um, uh, negotiated pricing on insurance for 58 public libraries in the state, including um, the Illinois Library Association. And um, the library has been with them for three years. And um, we do have a little bit of an increase that's come up this year, as I explained um, in my, my memo to you all about this. Um, the insurance uh, market is considered a hard market right now. Um, excess liability costs have gone up significantly in the insurance industry, due in part to a lot of things beyond our control, natural disasters with the West being on fire, the South having hurricanes, and um, a lot of us under a lot more water here in the Midwest than we've seen previously. Uh, that's certainly affecting the insurance industry and costs are rising as an effect of that. Um, there is a 28% increase in our contract this year. However, um, Lyra did notify that they had uh, notified us earlier this year prior to our budget approval uh, that we would anticipate such a cost. And in fact, we budgeted $40,000 um, for our insurance this year and the contract total came in just under that $40,000 threshold. So um, what- 40,000? Um, correct. Yeah. Okay. So we're, uh, the, the contract total this evening is 39,686 and we budgeted 40. Both of those numbers combined there. Okay. And I'll motion approval if it's not too early to do so um, of the Library of Illinois Risk Agency, otherwise known as LIRA, renewal of property casualty and workers' compensation insurance for December 31st, 2019 through December 31st, 2020, for, as you just said, Anthony, uh, for a contract total of $39,686. Second. Is, is it moved and second? Mm -hmm. Is discussion. there a discussion? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, it's been moved and second for the approval of the Libraries of Illinois Risk Agency LIRA renewal of property casualty and workers' compensation insurance for December 31st, 2019 through December 31st, 2020 for a contract total of 39686 and we have the roll call. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. The motion passed. Okay, the next item on the agenda is our annual per capita grant application. This is for fiscal year 2020. Um, we escalated this um, um, grant application as the due date is set for January 15th. So we completed that application and it is um, attached behind um, attachment 10 in your packet. Um, do you all have any questions about the per capita grant? Mm -hmm. Just how much do we get from it? Oh, um, golly. Um, Thirty, thirty some thousand. I'm, I'm so sorry. Thirty-three. Thirty-two thousand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Close. And change. <laughs> Any discussion? Oh well. Need a motion. I'll motion approval of the per capita capita grant application for fiscal year 2020. I'll second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any discussion? It's been moved and seconded to approve the per capita. May I have your attention, please? The library will be closing in five minutes. Please bring your materials to the circulation desk now for checkout. Thank you. 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 Thank Trustee Johnson, absent. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Aye. Trustee McDonald? Aye. Motion passed. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, last month um, the board approved the uh, calendar for um, 2020, which includes the closings for the library. And at that time, we didn't have a date set for our annual staff development day. We have selected Friday, March 20th for that. Um, so what we'd like to have you do is um, approve that. And we also found a Scrivener's error in the document mm -hmm. um, where we were slated to be closed on Easter Monday. We close on Easter Sunday, so we've corrected <laughs> that date. And you've got a suggested motion there to make those corrections. Okay, I move that the library be closed on March 20th, 2020 for staff development day and the adjusted 2020 calendar for closings to uh, correct the closing for Easter Sunday, changing from, as you decided, the, the Monday, April 13th to Sunday, April 12th. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, that the library be closed on March 20th, 2020 for staff development day and that the 2020 calendar of closings also be updated to correct the closing for Easter Sunday, changing Monday, April 13th to Sunday, April 12th. Any discussion? I'll just say it again. Yes, okay. Let's, no discussion, then it, it's been moved that the library be closed <laughs> and seconded. That can be a voice. <laughs> Thank you, good. Yes. <laughs> in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Pass unanimously. Okay. Here's one that I'd like to move in second. Okay. We have you do both? <laughs> <laughs> you both? Go. Uh, uh, we have got done quite a lot of business tonight, and so we're proposing that the December 2019 regular board meeting be canceled. It's scheduled for Tuesday, December 17, 2019. If the December meeting is canceled, the next regular meeting will be Tuesday, January 21st, 2020. So someone needs to move. The Second. Oh, I move. Oh, did you move it? Did, uh, no, I'm just discussing oh, it. I threw okay. that out there. Because okay. we didn't I, I, know what we were talking well, about. Well, they want to motion it. Okay. Yeah, you can motion it. Oh, I thought you want to. Oh, okay. I'm not allowed oh, to. Okay, then I will. On your behalf, yes, you Lisa. Are. I've been to parliamentary procedure. Okay. No, no, no. On, no, on no, your no. behalf, Lisa, I'm going to move that the Board of Library Trustees <laughs> cancel our previously scheduled Tuesday, December 17th, 2019 regular board meeting. And we'll cancel that meeting and resume business at the next regular board meeting on Tuesday, January 21st. 2020, which is here all too soon. Okay. I'll second. <laughs> I would note for the record that we're not going to resume business. We yes. will simply meet again. That's yeah. true. Yes. Okay. We're not going to discontinue anything. <laughs> <laughs> we'll resume our meeting uh, meeting uh, meeting momentum. We'll yeah. meet again. Yes. yes. Can, can we do this voice vote? We sing that. Yeah. Do we need the voice vote? Voice vote is sufficient. Okay. Yep. okay. Sufficient. Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Happy New Year. <laughs> Anyone who's really seriously opposed can show up for the meeting <laughs> <laughs> on that evening, but this room might not be available. <laughs> My lights are going to be on. <laughs> okay. President, the director's report. First year. Oh, okay. Yeah. First year. Here's what we're, we're, we're talking about doing board development and went to a workshop at Schoenberg, and it was a great workshop. It was on um, board fiduciary experience. It was the same uh, presenter that uh, trustee, not trustee, but Director Austin had gotten us uh, an invitation to, but there weren't enough of us that could have it here as a, and it would have been a freebie. So in light of that, and I'm just looking for well, I don't have it. In light of that, we're proposing to do a workshop where we will go over what our, and I'll just briefly talk about please. what it is, I as opposed to the library is closed. Thank you. Good night. It's basically looking at board relationships, fiduciary responsibilities, uh, just how to be civil and have conversations and dialogue, what our role is and what our role isn't. And sometimes I think it's good to have someone neutral come in to sort of talk about it. And then uh, I learned a lot from the parliamentary procedure workshop. And so it was excellent. And I know that 
Trustee Rogers also is a parliamentary ex expert. So one of the things we're thinking about is, in addition to her maybe having, like, maybe a brief parliamentary tidbits or tips at every meeting, mm. but it, it's just, we're just, this is all information, so mm -hmm. it's to get your thoughts on it. And I just think it's excellent. She has a great website. We will send that website to you because she covers everything from what minutes are supposed to do and what minutes aren't supposed to do. Uh -huh. What's your so name? I, Who is it? Her Nancy name is Sylvester. Nancy Sylvester. Okay, thank you. So that's one thing. The other thing that uh, it'll be soon time for our, to get geared up for our strategic plan, and I think there are a lot of both new and old trustees because of uh, to learn a little bit more about what the trends are. And one of the things I was proposing, and after just listening to that and uh, going to the ILA, is having each department head talk about the trends that are impacting them mm -hmm. over the next five mm -hmm. years and how we can take advantage of that and what are the implications for us. So looking at that also, and that would be a half day where we would be involved with the different department heads mm -hmm. to get a handle on what the trends are, because we really should be focusing on the bigger picture as opposed to in the guts of some mm -hmm. of the little things. So what I was curious about is, is a weekend, and we need to poll everybody, but is it better to do, and it would be a half day, and it'd probably be broken up into two parts, because the trends and what how Wilmet does and how, what we need to do and what we need to do to prepare for the future would be another half day. So is it better to do it on a Saturday? I, I think evening, I think a lot of people are tired uh, unless you can do it pretty, that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. But in terms of being inclusive of everybody, what works best for those that are here? And then we will poll the others. Too. So half day, like three hours? Yes. So either weekend or weekday morning or afternoon. Then. Or night, yeah. Or night. But, mm -hmm. I think I, I agree with you. I think night is, is difficult, three hours from. Especially if the staff's been here all day. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I, would, I guess my personal preference would be to have it during the week sometime mm -hmm. when it wouldn't. Uh, I don't know if that. If it's worse to inconvenience somebody at that time, or if the staff and the department heads um, would rather have it during the work hours at some point, mm -hmm. so I could, I would go with whatever the majority. Well, and maybe just do a doodle poll and see what happens right. in mm -hmm. terms of what the response mm -hmm. back is, so that because it's important, I think, that everybody show up for. It. So I think we have to also be sure of maybe multiple dates. Yep. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and based on different availabilities. Availabilities, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Travel. But it's not happening until next year. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Okay. Are there any other thoughts of what you would like covered? And if you got thoughts, just email me. You mean in something? Yeah. Like this. In terms of this, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think in terms of just looking at the trends, I think it's important. Mm -hmm. Know that. That's it. Thank Good. you. Thank you for doing the research. Okay. The the next item um, on our agenda is the director's report. Um, and in the interest of time, I will try to keep things brief here, but I, there are a few things I'd like to call your attention to. Um, earlier this month, um, in our strategic plan progress updates, um, objective one three, um, one of our Continuing goals is to host public forums for residents to explore and discuss community-wide issues and topics. Um, earlier this year, you may recall that we had the um, American Creed grant, um, and we hosted a number of events there in partnership with the League of Women Voters Will Met. Um, this, uh, earlier this month on, on the 9th, um, we hosted an event with a, a nonpartisan organization called Better Angels. And the name of their workshop was called How to Talk Across the Political Divide. And um, I attended this event um, along with um, a head of adult services, Betty Georgie. And what we observed was over 40 participants who um, would identify as red or blue and would pair up with another person of the same persuasion. And then they would speak to the other person 
from their position. And the other person would then pretend that they are the opposite persuasion. And then they were given cues and opportunity to interface with one another and engage in a civil dialogue and a sort of structured conversation um, so that we can respect that um, our, our values uh, oftentimes inform our political positions. Um, and what I found really valuable about this workshop is that we had disparate ide ideologies represented and we remained very civil and we learned a lot about one another in, in that process. Um, everyone who attended, uh, I would say unanimously, everyone who attended found that the workshop was very valuable. Um, and it's the type of thing that I think is all about community building and recognizing one another and our neighbors. Um, it, it left me feeling light and, and happy in a time when, um, when we have conversations like this. Um, maybe this time of the year when family gets together and you've got a lot of folks around the table that maybe don't all agree about things. Um, it made me feel encouraged. Um, so we're looking for an opportunity to continue to host um, forums like this, um, be they political or otherwise, uh, to continue to discuss um, topics that are going to be um, of importance to our community. So I just wanted you to be aware of that as um, part of our continued strategic plan objectives. Um, a little further into my report, talking about collections. I know we've been talking about our periodicals collection for a while. I think it's just incumbent upon me to mention again that this year, um, we have tracked about a 10% decrease in the number of magazines that have been, um, that are held in our collection. And that is due in part to the publishing industry shifting its trends. There are a lot of magazines that have ceased publication, are switching to online only publication, are limiting their distribution, or just changing the frequency of their issues. And a lot of that is having an impact on the way that we provision that information. Um, so we talk about trending. That's certainly one of the things that we're recognizing with physical collections. Um, in the last two years, we've seen a 10% reduction in the number of titles there. Um, so we continue to evaluate that, and I just wanted you to be aware that that's one collection that seems to be going the way of the dinosaur. Um, in terms of digital collections, we've talked about this previously. Um, making national news right now is Macmillan Publishers embargo on libraries. Uh, Macmillan Publishing is restricting all libraries to a single copy of digital titles um, that they are publishing. Um, this has created a firestorm of uh, feedback um, uh, across social media. Um, the American Library Association, Illinois Library Association, a number of individual libraries and advocacy groups are speaking up. I've got links in my report here. If you as individual trustees, um, constituents, um, staff, members of the community, um, if you find that that is an appalling way to um, have publications serve their communities, um, you can add your voice to those uh, pages, and there are other uh, links there that can uh, provide you with more information about how to get involved in advocating for public libraries. Um, Excuse we, me, would you put something on the website, a play, or do you find that do we need to talk about We, we can talk about that. Okay. okay. Um, so uh, Rails, uh, the library is a member of the Rails organization, has a page that's dedicated towards lo local advocacy issues. We've talked about that around this table as well, about keeping up to date with issues that affect libraries. For right now, I think that's a really great place to go to. It collects everything that impacts us locally, um, or at least regionally. Um, I don't think that there are any uh, direct threats in our immediate community, but um, on, on a broader scale, this is a great place to learn about um, the publishing world and, and how some of those trends are changing. Um, okay, so any questions about that? All right. Uh, moving along into programming, um, October was exciting in that we launched our, our uh, first Maker Lab programs. Um, we also, as I mentioned last month, got our, our new 3D printer. And um, so our, we had three Maker Lab events in October, on October 5th and 10th. And we had um, 63 patrons attend those events, which is really great turnout. And we had 75 attendees on our Saturday Maker Lab event on November 2nd. Um, so if you compare that with the numbers that we had on um, our Maker Fest earlier in February, uh, it's true that uh, the Wilmette community is really jazzed about making <laughs> and everything that relates to that, whether it's uh, making jewelry or 
being innovative in, in other fashions with regards to our 3D printing. Um, the November Maker Lab alone generated three, 13 items uh, to print on our 3D, 3D printer. Um, if you're familiar with 3D printers, you, you know full well that they cannot be printed that quickly. Yeah. So um, the demand is increasing and we've only just launched it. So we're currently exploring an opportunity to um, get another 3D printer so we can meet demand and uh, uh, get that out in public view so folks can see um, the services that we're offering there with that. Um, stay tuned for more information about the, the Maker Labs because uh, that's definitely programming that's going to continue to emerge here. Um, also happening in October, technology-wise, um, CCS welcomed Indian Trails Library. Um, we were down for, for two days um, during that time frame. Um, and during that downtime, we were still able to sustain operations and everything came up just the way that we expected. The reason I make note of this today is that tomorrow morning I'm going to the, uh, the, the next uh, CCS meeting and on the agenda is a motion to um, let Palatine Public Library join the CCS consor consortium. So um, there could be yet another member coming on in the next year and that'll mean perhaps another chance at downtime. Um, so we'll, we'll keep you posted on, on what's happening there. Um, I'm familiar with that collection. Um, I think that it would be great to be able to have access for, for that collection here um, for our constituents yeah. as well. Um, I included one picture in my report this time, and that was a social media post about the last of our book drops getting its final wraps. If you're out in the parking lot this evening, um, when you head out, you'll notice that um, they all have that same branding on them now, and they look really attractive. We've been getting some positive feedback about mm -hmm. that. Uh, the last item of note in my report is in October we had the um, ILA annual conference down in Tinley Park. Um, six representatives from Wilmette Library attended, um, two of our youth services librarians, our team librarian Krista Hutley, um, community services, um, uh, creative services uh, coordinator Jennifer Bartell, and myself as well as Trusty McDonald all attended. Um, and uh, three of us were presenters, so that was that was really exciting. We all brought back a lot of valuable information, and we're going to coordinate um, a time where um, the attendees can um, present for the entire staff to be able to come in and learn about what we uh, discovered at the meeting. So um, you'll keep us. We'll, we'll keep you posted, posted on, on the outcomes okay. of that. In the meantime, you've got a brief synopsis there on page seven of my report to kind of walk you through um, what we saw at the conference. And that concludes my report. Do you all have any questions about library activity in October? I want to thank you all for attending the um, State of the Village um, on November 6th. Uh, that was a great event um, hosted by that the League. That was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and um, President McDonald gave a report summarizing our activities. That was an excellent report. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Thank you. you did us proud. <laughs> I even wore dress. <laughs> right. And looked great. Thank you. Looked great. Okay. And next we have, um, we've got some committee reports. So um, now Trustee Johnson's not here to give an update on advocacy and partners. Um, would either of you like to give a summary about the last meeting that we had with Advocacy and Partners? That was on October 28th. Well, we can put our heads together. We <laughs> talked about the possibility of solar panels um, here, and um, our outcome was that we were going to possibly look into that. There's a group here in Wilmette, as well as uh, Trustee Johnson talked about a group from Evanston, and um, we thought, where did we go with that? I, th I believe we felt that it would be best, if, we, if it was feasible, we would go with the Wilmette group, mm -hmm. and um, we're still looking into that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. And, and I think that one also falls within facilities, but also I think Director Austin, with his subgroup, was going to talk and find out more about oh, yes. what the park district is right. considering because they mentioned that at the State of the Village right. meeting is where we found out about the solar mm -hmm. panels. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other... Well, uh, what else do we talk about? Uh, we How quickly, thank updates. you. We did... I'm just trying to look through this yeah. stuff to see what I wrote. <laughs> we did also updates basically on... Uh, 
we've uh, oh, each absolutely. of the ones have taken right. and talked to the village trustees, so we just reported out on what that was, you know, the nature of that. And, and talked about the parking issue and what some thoughts were in terms of first handling what we can take care of. Right. Because that lot, adjacent lot, will never be available. And now that there's going to be additional construction, who knows what's going to happen. But in the interim, to start putting a map when there are big events at the library of alternative parking places, which occur on the weekend because you've got the village lot and the metro lot. And then the other thing uh, was, that was about it. And then about the pool, uh, to see if we can monitor people who are in the places that we lease. Right. The the post time. office. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Postal to, to employees. To clean up what we've right. got right now. Yeah. Right. So I think that was but your report was very helpful and, and in, informative about meeting when you met with um, Bob Belinsky, head of the village, and the dialogue that. Yeah. I think very positive. And so I think all of us felt that meeting with the village trustees was very positive. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So well, we I think that goals. was about it. <laughs> we all have different goals. I think for the library trustees that, that, do a fine, that, that the library does a fine job of serving the movement public. Okay. Great. Um, we also had a finance committee meeting that largely centered around the, the uh, topics of discussion that we had here today, namely the levy this last time. But Ron, do you have anything else that you'd like to summarize about the last finance committee meeting? Um, there will be future discussion of the policies related to finance. We haven't addressed those yet, but they will be on future agendas. Everything else I think we've covered in other business tonight. Okay. All right. And then lastly for committee reports, um, ILA and rails. Um, I don't know that I have anything else to add at, at this time. Jan, do you have anything that you'd like to, to update? Um, just a, a couple of things. There was one article uh, in the ILA of uh, seven cool things libraries are doing beyond the books. A lot of it was what we do already, preserving history, culture, genealogy, that kind of thing. But there were two things that I noted that, um, one of which is happening here at the library, actually, that they talk about libraries being a catalyst for the local community. And I think um, you have done an awful lot to involve the community since you've been here. And one of the things that I noticed, though, was that the uh, we, we are going to start an intergenerational program. Uh, we have the maker spaces for that, but also conversation classes. And uh, that also brings in a community that was not necessarily a full part of the library. And so that's, that's a very positive step. And uh, one of the other things that was mentioned was that the library is a safe place for the LGBT community. And that's very important also. And there are other things. Libraries raise awareness on environmental issues, which we certainly did with the renovation and what happened there. And it's at the top of a priority list of when we're looking at other things. Um, the only other article of note was the um, fire, the Easy Fire, which was in Simi Valley, California, not that long ago. It was very fast moving, took down a lot of buildings, a lot of houses. And um, Southern, that was the one where Edison, uh, at one of Edison's transfer stations is what they think started that fire. But what was interesting, besides the fire itself, is that the Reagan Library is right in Simi Valley, and it would have been totally destroyed had it not been for one thing, goats, G-O-A-T-S, goats. Because they, have, they actually have isolated the library by bringing goats in to eat down the, the lawns and the brush and everything else. So the fire went around it, but it never touched the library itself. So a lot of people who are really interested in preserving history and uh, other things like that were very, very relieved. There are just millions and millions of pieces 
of um, history and background and everything else at that place. So we had one three printer and four goats. <laughs> well, I just want to say, Trustee <laughs> right. Barsha, are you suggesting that we get goats to maintain the lawn at the library? Yeah. yeah. Well, that would be a good idea. We might get it to Which parking spread. lot do we keep them in? <laughs> <laughs> which parking space? Which parking they, space? They give us okay. a little more for the goats. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Lies are dying. Yeah. Right. Anyway. The other thing with the ILA, when I attended, in, and we talked about it briefly, but I forget which committee was. Uh, the elimination of fines yes. and the panel that I attended right. and so now I think the staff but before that the staff has been looking at it and yeah, reviewing mm -hmm. it and so they will come up with a recommendation to present to the board after the, as they look at the process right so we that had, was the only other thing that I thought forgot that we discussed right yes. we had a, a to wasn't there a total in our at our last meeting packet that uh, overdue fines account for what, yeah. 48 thousand mm -hmm. or something like that so, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a couple other information items in there. Um, this month I've set up a couple, uh, well, four um, events where I'm inviting the staff to come in and meet with me and we'll have an open conversation. They can share ideas, observations, ask questions, um, anything to help me to get to know them and for them to get to know me. Um, I've got one tomorrow afternoon and uh, the last one will be next Monday. Um, and we'll continue to do these on a more regular basis, but just want to let you know that that's how I'm connecting with the staff. Is this individual or you have small groups? Small what? groups, <laughs> yeah. The first one, um, I think we had 10 uh, staff show up for that mm -hmm. one, so. Um, but it's open call. I mean, you aren't limited the number they can come not talk at all. to you. No. So it's who oh, I have okay. cookies and tea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, <laughs> and is it across, did you, have you, I, you know, like two from this department, two, from, you know, or how did, is it? Open. It's open to anyone to come in. Oh, and okay. Yep. So a whole department could show up at they one could. time. Yeah. Okay. Assuming that they've got coverage for right. you know right. their, their regular <laughs> operations. Yep. Mm, okay. Um, the circulation department is going to be hosting our annual holiday party. That's going to be on Wednesday, December 11th. Um, you all are invited. Um, if you haven't already gotten notice about that, you will. Yeah. You have. Yeah. Last week, <laughs> and it's in your packet yes, so this evening as well. You've it's got the flyer for it. Hard yeah. copy right yeah. here. Yeah. All right. Um, on Thanksgiving, uh, just so that you're aware, we close on Wednesday at 5 o'clock. That's been our tradition, and we remain closed on Thanksgiving Thursday. Um, the other closures there for the holidays um, in December, um, we closed on Tuesday the 24th, Wednesday the 25th. And then for New Year, we'll be closed on um, Tuesday the 31st and Wednesday, uh, New Year, January 1st. Um, because we're not going to have the meeting next month, I also want to let you know, too, that um, an event that I attended for the first time last year, I'd like to encourage, um, if, if you're able to attend, um, the League of Women Voters of Wilmette um, is inviting um, me and the board to participate in the annual Student Government Leaders Kickoff event. Mm -hmm. This is the eighth grade uh, program at... Two. Remember we talked about two board members? Yeah, so okay. you're going to have to duke it out. There can be two that can attend. <laughs> I've done it. It's great. Um, I've it's, done it, too. It's I'll bad. be out of it's town. So. so the eighth graders at Wilmette Junior High um, participate in this. Um, they get to learn about what local government does. Uh, they get to learn firsthand from trustees as well as executive leaders. Um, it's also a great way for us um, to advocate for the library and get to know our peers uh, that are serving on other boards. Um, so that is Wednesday, January 8th at 7 p.m. at Wilmette Junior High. If you're interested, let me know and we can coordinate um, to get folks to attend. And you learn a lot about the other villages yeah. because they split you off into a table. So I think you're looking for two. Okay. okay. Uh, the only other thing I, I want to add is that I forgot to add when we talk about the orientation that um, Director Austin has started doing a employee orientation where he will take the employees around to the different departments. Human um, Resources does human this, resources not me personally. But uh -huh. yeah. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Division of roles. But so we were wondering if uh, some of the, if the, if. The, you all would be interested, the trustees, in doing a tour of just the different departments sure. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it could work prior to a board meeting. Today. We could do that. Um, just gauging interest, you know, if, if yeah. you'd like to, uh, you know, to get a better sense for how the operations run, um, this would be a chance to tour the building, um, see some of the staff, get to know the departments, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, 
we, we could do it as a group. We could do it, um, you know, on an individual basis as it fits your schedule. Um, but it just it occurred to me that, hey, we do this for new staff. It's something we should do for new trustees, um, but it's an also a great opportunity as a remedial for, for anyone who'd like we to do more. We have done it for the entire board prior to a meeting on a couple of occasions. Mm -hmm. um, the most recent occurrence, I think, was prior to our last building project. Um, I don't think we've done it since that project was completed. No, no, let's, I gotta, I gotta be in at 30. Okay. Excuse me. They're gonna join us all the time. Okay. Okay. Is there a motion? Any of it? Business? Motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> second. Is there second. a second? Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Okay. Gotcha. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Adjourn. <laughs> I'm leaving these things here because they seem to be somewhat sensitive in material. These are all recent.